Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the 27th Annual National Security Law Conference uh, here at Duke Law School. We're being joined right now by Rear Admiral Melissa Burt of the United States Coast Guard. She's the Chief Counsel and Staff Judge Advocate and a very interesting person. I had an opportunity to have a phone conversation with her a, a little while ago and started out thinking it was going to be five minutes. I think we were on there for 40 minutes. Now, I'm, <laughs> I'm Robert. I got to tell you, I was really glad about that because I think I got about 10,000 steps <laughs> during <laughs> as I was keeping track. Uh, Admiral Burt, uh, you can see her full bio on the agenda, and actually I'm going to get into, hopefully she'll share some with us about her personal journey to becoming a top legal officer in the Coast Guard. Uh, but before we get to that, I do see that you went to, G did you go to GW, is that correct? I did, and I, um, for law school, and yeah. I don't have a GW t-shirt because I didn't love GW, but I, I did waste a year at Harvard <laughs> at the Kennedy School, so I'm wearing that. Well, you, you know what I'm going to be sending you, right? It's going to be a Duke Law t-shirt, so uh, <laughs> That's you, great. you have to have that in your repertoire now that you've officially been a speaker for us. Uh, Admiral, we've been posing this to a lot of our guest speakers because uh, it's on everybody everybody's mind. What are your uh, thoughts about the, the situation in Ukraine? Does it affect the Coast Guard? Does it affect your, your organization? What are your thoughts? Well, um, it's very disturbing. It's uh, Ukraine is really the, the wall for democracy and uh, it's what's sort of keeping uh, democracy on that part of Eastern Europe. Um, it's just uh, very shocking to me that that uh, we've gotten here. Um, personally, I uh, I reached out. We have a few Coast Guard people who are uh, have Ukrainian families and uh, and families who are still there. And one of them wrote me today that uh, her brother's in Kiev and he's uh, they're being showered with with bombs mm -hmm. and. Uh, it's uh, it's kind of scary, and his family is out uh, about 50 kilometers out of the city, and they're um, oh, excuse me, 100 kilometers out of the city, and they're taking in refugees, um, both at home and in the, the school where they teach. So it's it is not um, this is a this is a war. This isn't just uh, talk about a war. It's really it's really serious and dangerous and scary for uh, the people who are there, and they don't they don't know what's going to happen uh, for the Coast Guard. It, you know, it's not, uh, it's, it's interesting because of a, a few things. The first thing is uh, we, you know, we're looking at shipping. We do have uh, Russian ships that call in our ports and uh, Ukrainian, not so much. Uh, and we have uh, Russian sailors aboard all, uh, all nationality uh, flagged ships. Um, but we're not at war with Russia. So uh, unless the ship has uh, issues, uh, or if we uh, have sanctions and embargoes placed on those, which I suspect will come, uh, we're not really in any position to take action against uh, shipping. And as far as crew members go, that's that has nothing to do with you know with us unless they're obviously dangerous. Um, so that's one aspect to it. The other aspect is we do a lot with Russia um, in. Uh, in our Coast Guard-like uh, commonalities. So the Russian Border Guard, which um, in my view probably uh, was much like the Stasi, but now <laughs> deals with the outside uh, world. Um, they've, uh, they're sort of their Coast Guard now, among other things, uh, they're their border security. And so we, um, we patrol the maritime boundary line with them. Uh, which is uh, you know between Alaska and the uh, and the um, eastern uh, part of uh, Russia, and that's for uh, fisheries violations, which are are very common. And uh, we do that jointly because nobody wants their uh, part of the ocean fished out over there, and also we don't want people fishing in the um, Arctic as it gets warmer. Um, so that's actually a shared responsibility. Uh, we do, we would do if there was oil spill or search and rescue, uh, we would continue that. 
Um, we actually have somebody at the State Department, one of our lawyers. So this morning, the State Department released a cable that uh, said, you know, activities with Russian officials um, uh, are, are hereby suspended. Um, and then they accepted a list of activities, uh, things like uh, weapons proliferation, things like that. And then they listed really all the five Coast Guard uh, things that we do with Russia. So I thought, oh my gosh, that's pretty funny. Um, so yeah, it's an it's a interesting position to be in. And we usually have a Russian speaking officer uh, up there in uh, our Alaska office just for that reason, because we do do a lot with, uh, with the Russians. And I could tell you a little, funny story that I'm not going to tell now unless we have extra time. <laughs> I'll tell it now. Okay. We like funny stories. <laughs> oh my gosh. So when I, uh, when I first, uh, I was uh, uh, like a, it's called a sector commander, but like an operational commander up in uh, Alaska. And my boss was a really funny guy. Uh, his name was Gene Brooks and he was a hoot. Um, he would tell these crazy stories at a, uh, and I, you know, I couldn't believe half of them, but, um, but one of them that actually was true, and I really don't even know whatever happened, but he was in some, uh, he was doing something with the Russians and he was over there and um, they gave him uh, like a machine gun <laughs> as a gift. <laughs> And he took it back on the, the uh, you know, the, the government aircraft. That was, his, uh, that was his speaker gift, so to speak. Yes. Isn't that crazy? And so, of course, uh, when it got back to uh, America and the Coast Guard, people were like, what are you doing? So they uh, they locked it up. I don't think they ever sent it back, but I don't I don't know where it is today. But that was that was like 10 years ago. But it, it was really funny. I was like, why would you accept a machine gun? He was like, wow, I thought it was really cool. You know, <laughs> the things so, that military life takes you, you know, you, that's the exciting part. I think it, it I, I just want to pay you a compliment here because I think it it's a little bit reflective of maybe how the military is is different from other kinds of organizations. The fact that you, the senior person, senior lawyer in the Coast Guard, was speaking to one of your troops who happened to have relatives who are in, in a tough, tough situation. And I like to think that that's the kind of thing that you know, goes on in the military. Hopefully it goes on in other organizations, but I, it's not that uncommon in the military, just by the way we, we do things. Which does bring me up to uh, describe a little bit the legal architecture of your, of your empire, your law firm <laughs> empire up there. <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, we're in a little bit of a transformation now uh, because of the NDAA. Uh, we're gonna be moving all of our prosecutors basically to one, uh, one team and they will prosecute everything. So since we don't have enough other offenses other than sexual uh, assaults, then we're just gonna have them do everything. And we're gonna co-locate them with probably a, a Navy Marine Corps uh, uh, trial judiciary so that we can just hub with them and work with them. So um, other than that though, we have uh, offices in the field, uh, working for different regional commanders and also for our area commanders. And they handle kind of the gamut of issues, which could be uh, a marine shipping issue, a pollution uh, oil spill issue, the colonial pipeline, uh, all kinds of things that come up. Uh, so it's uh, mainly operational. And they'll also advise uh, commanders on, um, on personnel issues uh, and ethics. Um, Clearly, they didn't have a very good attorney up there in Alaska at the time. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, um, yeah, yeah, so they, you know, they do sort of a variety. Your your JAG empire is a little bigger than I thought it was. I, I think it's, it's um, 230, 240, something. Those something. are JAGs, but then we also have a lot of civilians. So I think our whole, our whole uh, because I'm the chief counsel and the TJAG, which is yeah. kind of a weird uh, a weird setup, but it's how we've been doing it. Um, but uh, yeah, so all told, we have, I think, almost 500 people between uh, support. And um, and then at our headquarters, we've got those folks who are out in the field. And at our headquarters, we have specialists 
who deal with all kinds of issues. So we have a general law office, which deals with everything from real estate, property transfer to COVID mandate. Um, we have our international maritime international law office, which deals with uh, the, the, all the law enforcement, our, our bilateral agreements and, and uh, treaties and, and legal and the cases that involve um, that, uh, you know, involve some of these things, uh, the uh, uh, appellate cases, they help uh, the Justice Department work with those. And then all the maritime shipping and the, um, where the, uh, the Coast Guard is the, uh, what is it called? We're the, the United States representative to the International Maritime Organization. So we have a lot of international uh, work that we do there. Um, environmental pollution, things like that, environmental laws affecting uh, the, uh, the rest of the world and us. Uh, so the legislation and the work uh, in there. And, um, and then we have other offices. We have a legislative law office. We have, um, we have our um, military justice uh, folks. Um, as I go down the corridor, we have claims and litigation, obviously dealing with uh, it, all kinds of all kinds of issues. <laughs> um, anyways, we have like specialists at our headquarters, and so the districts often call them. And then uh, we have the really fun uh, job. I would say it's really fun. Uh, we have uh, special assistant uh, U.S. attorneys in offices where we have a lot of cases, and they tend to prosecute uh, migrant smuggling and drug smuggling and some environmental uh, type of cases. Uh, so it's really it's great for the U.S. Attorney's Office because they have an extra prosecutor, and it's great for us because we get a lot of experience and know I can bring that back to the Coast Guard and say, "Hey, this is what you need for these cases." So that's pretty much what we have. I don't. And then the other thing we have is a lot of our attorneys are not in an attorney job at any given time. So because you can't have a pyramid with um, with that would be a square. <laughs> if everybody stayed in in the jag, and so we're fortunate that uh, we have opportunities for people to uh like our senate liaison right now is a is a jag um actually we have a lot of uh, congressional fellows who are who are jags um because they like them <laughs> we're we're very sought after um we have uh i'm trying to think we have a lot of people in the operational world marine safety inspection that kind of uh thing working with shipping companies um and then uh people like me who worked uh, op operations ashore and then um, ship drivers. One of our uh, our senior officers is this is the commanding officer of the National Security Cutter Stratton, which is right it's now over in the Pacific. So lots of uh, just we're kind of all over the place. Um, it's it's an organization that allows you to spread your wings, I guess you would say. You do raise a question. Do you have to be a ship driver to be a Coast Guard JAG? <laughs> no. Actually, a serious question. <laughs> Oh, no. In fact, you don't even need to. Well, maybe you need to swim. I don't think so. But uh, <laughs> I, I went to the Coast Guard Academy. And uh, so uh, when we graduate from there, we tend to go to flight school or, or ships. Back when I went, you had to go to a ship, um, which doesn't sound it sounds like prison, but it was uh, it was fun. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, from there, people kind of go different ways. And Part of the reason why we go to sea is to um, understand the culture because that's kind of our, our culture. So, um, and we have people who go, so there's another thing that I'm trying to actually explore a little further. So right now the folks who come into the uh, JAG Corps who didn't go to the academy and are coming in after law school, they go to a, a direct commission program, which is like a month or five weeks, it's very short. Uh, just to understand a little bit about the Coast Guard, the JAG, and, and just get the uniform straight. Um, and then they go to uh, Navy JAG school uh, for uh, 11 weeks, I think, at this point, or 12 weeks, something like that. And they do the Navy uh, curriculum, which is heavy on the uh, learning how to do a courts martial. And then uh, we have like a Coast Guard uh, segment at the end where they learn a lot about law enforcement and our other things. Like, so we have cyber authority, we have intel authority. Uh, you know, we just have a lot of different authorities. And so we take some time to look at that. Um, so that said, um, the folks who went to officer candidate school, which is 16 weeks um, and come out more junior, um, who 
our lawyers happen to be lawyers, they have a lot of flexibility. Um, but who wants to come go to OCS and be an ensign when you're already a lawyer? So I'm trying to work something out where we give, uh, I have to, it's obviously this is a legal, uh, a legal authorities issue, but I would love to give our judge advocates some choices because what tends to happen is we get judge advocates who loved their first tour, or their first two tours as a, an attorney, and they want to go out to the field. And they're already, uh, they're already pretty senior. They're uh, lieutenant commanders, which um, is, uh, you know, it's like a mid-grade officer. So it's very hard for them to go start in an area. So I want to, I want to figure out a way to see if we can get our, um, our folks to have a choice. So if they, if they're interested in going to operations, they would go the uh, officer candidate route so they can have a little more time to qualify and, and be an apprentice in operations or go the traditional JAG route if they want to do a full JAG uh, career. And they certainly can. We have a lot of very successful folks who have a full JAG career. And now we're actually going to have uh, our, our military justice. Uh, that's going to be a really good career path as well. So we have a lot of options, but I, I want to make sure that people have uh, what fits them as well as what fits us so that we all get um, what we want out of uh, our experience. You know, what strikes me is that the range of legal areas that, you know, you have to address everything from courts martial to international law to law enforcement to environmental. How do you how do you do the training? How do you keep people trained up in all these different areas or do you, do you keep them in an area or how does that work? Uh, so some people are really uh, have expertise in one thing. Um, our civilians, of course, have a lot of expertise so that we rely heavily on. Uh, we have great civilian attorneys. Um, and actually, some of them are, are uh, JAGs who, who then uh, decide they want to uh, stay put um, and do one sort of practice area. Uh, in fact, we have we have a lot of Air Force, uh, uh, retired Air Force JAGs, <laughs> as a matter of fact. Um, well, actually, I was going to ask you for a job at the end of this. So. <laughs> we, we do have a good time. Um, so basically, you know, you, you can touch on things or you can delve. So if you have a tour in maritime international law on the law enforcement side, you're going to be spending a lot of time on that. Um, if you're in general law and you uh, were blessed with running this COVID mandate, uh, you're going to know a lot about how to give people orders to take vaccines and how not to. Um, so it, it really, uh, it depends, but we do rotate around. And so if somebody wants to stay a lawyer, uh, the chances are we would like them to do other, other jobs because that helps you understand the Coast Guard better. And so like working on the Hill, uh, that is great for us uh, because it helps, helps our lawyers understand how, you know, how we're uh, getting legislation passed that's beneficial to us um, and it gives us some good connections on the Hill. So that's good. Um, in terms of operations, when I came into the Coast Guard, when I first became a lawyer, I felt like you had to kind of nose your way into the tent if you wanted to you know, be involved in, in operations. And that has completely shifted. Um, we have, uh, there's never a meeting where you don't have a, a lawyer. It's, it's remarkable and it's demanded. Like that's sort of people rely heavily because all of our operations are based on authorities. They're not uh, based on orders. So there's always this consultation that's sort of, you know, part of the part of what you bake into the mix. So it's very integrated. The planning of, of any kind of operation or the response, uh, everything goes through a lawyer. So even like a, in the middle of the night, if there's a, a big oil spill or there's a uh, one of these narco trafficking cases that's uh, that's heading. Um, toward the U.S. and, and we have intelligence on it, um, they still have to call an attorney and make sure that uh, they've met all of their, um, all their wickets so that we don't do something uh, wrong. And, uh, and, and also just, it's easier for me uh, as an attorney because I've had so much time in operations that the way I, uh, the way I work with our operators, the way I work with our senior leaders, um, I'm just very comfortable with with what they're doing. I, I, I hate to talk to an attorney and uh, you know in the administration, whatever administration it is, 
and they've never even uh, been aboard a ship or, you know, seen a, a port. You know, we actually took a port field trip <laughs> because we were trying to show people like, this is how a port works. And, and this is because we're talking about cybersecurity. If you're, if you're trying to uh, write legislation or write regulations regarding cybersecurity uh, in a port, uh, it's good to actually know what we're requiring of people. So it's, it's much easier if you do have, uh, you know, you combine your career and the, the operators like that uh, as well, uh, because they know that we, uh, you know, we get what they're, what they're driving at so that if they ask a, a question that's really not the right question, um, then we can get to there. Yeah, I think that's true with any kind of practice of law, uh, but I, I try to harp on it to know the client's business because especially in the military, uh, because they tend to a little bit test you if you really know, you know, what their business is. And if you fail that test, that's that's not a good thing. Let's hear a noticed, little. Oh, oh, go ahead. I was going to say, I have noticed the uh, Army uh, folks, the Army Jags who serve uh, uh, serve with the Airborne uh, commands, they have their um, they do their jumps. So that's that's interesting to me. They get qualified. And I was thinking, wow, well, well, I didn't go into the Army. <laughs> As a matter of fact, uh, right after this, we have two 82nd Airborne JAGs, and, and both these young ladies are, are going to give us a briefing. I, I'll, I'll ask them if they're jump qualified. It's funny because the Air Force, the Air Force badge, the Air Force JAG badge looks slightly like an upside down Airborne. <laughs> oh, yeah, a lot of times right. people people think, uh, well, General, you got your badge on upside down, but no, actually, it's not an airborne badge. Now, I will but, tell you before you uh, speak to these uh, these Army Jags that every time I go to the Army Jag School in Charlottesville, um, a lot of people say they want to transition to the Coast Guard. <laughs> so, just, uh, just so you know, I thought, uh, I thought the Air Force had a lot on that, but uh, I'm sure the Air Force that would be uh, you would get some takers as well. But uh, I think well, they, I, I should yeah. confess that uh, back in the day, uh, I wanted to go on the Coast Guard as a JAG, uh, but I think at that time, virtually all the JAGs had gone to the academy. Which brings me to ask you, let's hear the Admiral Burt story. How did she wind up as the, A, how'd you get interested in the Coast Guard? B, uh, JAG, or going to law school, and C, what are your words of wisdom? Hmm. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Okay, <laughs> so I would say I'm the um, an, an accidental two-star. Um, my, uh, just because I, and, I, I know that feeling <laughs> <laughs> and this is advice for anybody um, don't count yourself out because you see people who you think are, are more skilled than you or, or uh, more polished than you or, or, or better than you in whatever way because um, people disappear along the way for one reason or another and, and then you're the one left. So <laughs> you don't count yourself out before you're pushed out if you really want something. Um, for me, my father was in the Coast Guard at the very end of World War II. He's uh, 94. He can't remember what day of the week it is now, but he does remember a lot from World War II. And uh, he really did very little. He was a seaman, uh, but it, it changed his life. He came, uh, his father was a uh, an immigrant who worked in a shipyard, uh, had no advanced education. And my father came back from the war and he uh, went to college on the GI Bill. And, and later he went to law school at night and um, he had a, an interesting career. He was a civil rights lawyer, which, which I thought was really strange that he wanted me to go to a military academy knowing, uh, yeah. <laughs> like, did you not know that was not a good thing for women back then? Uh, but I, uh, I, I did that mainly to please him. I'll, I'll be honest. Um, also, I was, I was, I was in Atlanta and for high school, and um, I had never been out to sea. I'd never been on a even a, a sailboat. I'd never gone sailing. I was just not, um, you know, I wasn't really attuned to that. And the the uh, literature for the academy had these very um, attractive people who clearly were not cadets um, <laughs> sailing boats and uh, really having a great time. And I thought, oh, gosh, I want to do that. I want to get out of the house and get out of Georgia. And uh, 
so that's why I went. And then um, I hated the academy, but I, I did make uh, friends for life. And that's sort of why I've stayed in. I, I just really the people. Um, and I've had interesting tours. I've done all kinds of things. Um, I don't, I did not have a desire to, to stay put, I guess you'd say. So I loved being, an, uh, when I was a prosecutor, I loved that. It was a lot of fun, but I, I, you know, you can't do that your whole life. And also, um, I realized that I wanted to have a Coast Guard uh, experience while I'm in the Coast Guard. So that's why I've kind of gone back and forth and, and done different things um, along the way. So, you know, I think that the lesson, uh, the other lesson is, you know, do what you enjoy because that's, um, that's how you're going to do your best work. And, and obviously as a leader, you try to um, make the environment enjoyable so that people are excited to do their best work. Uh, one of the questions that we had from one of our students, Madison Dunbar at 1L, uh, I guess you've been a military judge at some point. Mm -hmm. And she wanted, I, I'd been a military judge too. Uh, she wanted to know what was your biggest challenge while serving as a military judge? Scheduling. So I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to say something that uh, I, I read the question uh, yesterday. Um, I'm going to say something that you you might find shocking, but I never found my um, my positions too challenging because I always had a network of people. And as you remember from being a military judge, you yeah. could always call another judge. So I had um, actually had Brian Judge was our chief trial judge when I was a judge. So I would call Captain Judge if I had questions, um, and uh, that's. Sounds really silly, but um, yeah. Don't and when tell me I they call him, called him Judge Judge, Judge Judge, yeah. <laughs> but oh, um, you can't even make that up. <laughs> and so um, I guess I always have felt uh, that if I was unsure of something, I wasn't by myself. Um, in terms of ethical uh, situations, probably more of that has happened outside of um, the you know being a judge. I haven't had any cases that were. Uh, you know, like the movies. So um, I, I did once uh, rip into a, oh no, that was when I was a prosecutor. Never mind. <laughs> well, tell us about it. <laughs> oh, I was so infuriated. And this guy still uh, still doesn't like me. Um, so <laughs> it was one of these, uh, it was a judge alone uh, sexual assault case. And uh, the judge, um, convicted the accused of assault, but um, accepted the word sexual. <laughs> and I was like, what have you done? <laughs> I was so angry. Anyway, um, like how, how is that possible <laughs> from what the evidence you've heard? So um, yeah, so you could get a, a mean, uh, obnoxious prosecutor like me who will yell at you when you uh, <laughs> have a, a result they don't like, but- um, I didn't have no, that too I, often. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I just, I, uh, I don't know. I guess I've always sort of spoken my mind, which uh, some people don't like. Gee, um, <laughs> uh, I am shocked. Is that? I thought that was just a recent, you know. So, I guess that's another thing that I like about the Coast Guard because I can be in the Coast Guard and uh, I could never behave this way in the other services. I mean, not, uh, you know, you you just can't you can't do these things. You can't be that different. Um, and you can't really have the, the kinds of discussions that we have about all kinds of issues. So it's just a little more, uh, like a family, um, you know, we have the weird uncles and, and all that, but, uh, but in general, we we bring our, we bring ourselves to work, which makes, uh, the Coast Guard better. And, uh, I think that's important. Let's, let's talk about some of the big issues that the Coast Guard is looking at. And I guess the Arctic comes up quite a bit. And I think the Russians have like 25 icebreakers and we have like two or one and a half. Is the other one working now? <laughs> oh my gosh. This has been a nightmare. Um, we're obviously, we're on a path to recapitalize, um, but VT Halter is, uh, is had some problems. They're back on track now, but um, yeah, do we yeah. even have many shipyards that can even build 
Ice we don't. This is a new, uh, this is a design. This is from a design. It's not, there's no ship like it. Um, because it has to break, uh, it has to break very heavy ice, which is like 36 inches of ice uh, down in the Antarctic to get into McMurdo. And um, so you need a lot of power and you need a, a either as a pods or a bow thruster that can really move you in case the winds are very high, which they are frequently in the um, Antarctic and Arctic. Um, what I would say is we don't have the same missions uh, as the Russians. Um, half of the Arctic, or actually probably more like three quarters, most of the Arctic is the Russians. Uh, and not, not uh, we have a really great slice, maybe a quarter, and then Canada has, I don't know. Anyway, uh, I can show you a picture from uh, above instead of a Mercator projection, and you would be like, oh, wow, I didn't realize, like, Russia's 11 time zones, and it's, uh, yeah. it's pretty big. Um, we do have a lot of resources in our part of the continental shelf, so that's important. But for Russia, they're, um, they're actually trying to charge uh, people to use their icebreakers. Um, they have to use their icebreakers to um, ship oil. And uh, Murmansk is actually a city um, on the Arctic. Um, they are in the Arctic Circle. Um, they're, they're operating all the time uh, with pipelines and everything else there. We are not. Um, so when we talk about uh, what our, our vessels are doing, it, it's not really a wartime mission normally. It, it, we carry a lot of scientists, um, especially as we're tracking, we're trying to uh, basically map our continental shelf and do um, understand climate change. Uh, mm -hmm. America wants to do that. <laughs> and, and so we assist by, we take these folks out and, um, it's very it's interesting work if you ever want to talk to a NOAA person, but they uh, they do some very interesting studies aboard our our cutters that are operating um, in both the Arctic and the Antarctic. So it, we do uh, you know science missions. We do we break uh, vessels out that um, get stuck. Uh, we have. Um, we, I'm, I'm waiting until we have another cruise ship uh, disaster because uh, there's ice all over. Even if you don't, you only see a little piece. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's in the waters up there, and yet uh, we have a lot of interest in tourism. Um, so, uh, yeah. So, so our next ships that we build, our next class, they are going to be outfitted with uh, the kind of intelligence suite that we would need to pick up on signaling and things like that. Um, we also, we had a, a few years ago, a couple of years ago, we had a Chinese uh, icebreaker research vessel. It, 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 pr it proposed to call itself. And they actually pulled into, uh, I think Nome. <laughs> and, uh, no, one, no one really even knew. Um, you know, they have to ask the State Department if they want to, if other countries want to just pull in and do. <laughs> so they, they were like um, Chinese folks wandering uh, around uh, the city of Nome, which was really not a big security emergency, but it just shows you how we're not, uh, we don't have a big Arctic presence. We don't even have bandwidth up there. So until we get um, get satellites and, and other things, uh, it's just not, it's not a very um, welcoming place and it's not built up for America. So the ships are the last of our problems, but they're, um, it, it, it would have to do a lot. We'd have to do a lot to have a presence there that's meaningful. What about the Pacific? You know, um, the <clears throat> PLA Navy uh, is out there, but also they have their maritime militia and, and they have their own Coast Guard too. Don't they? I think um, they do. Um, their Coast Guard has taken on a, a more military role. Uh, maybe I'm trying to think when this happened. A few years ago, they moved from one ministry to another, and the ministry they're in now is uh, includes uh, some defense operations and and security. So they have moved a little bit away from just being a Coast Guard. Um, Although we have as well, I guess you could say. Um, so I don't know why it sounds so nefarious when they do it, but it, <laughs> we find it nefarious. And um, these maritime militias, that's basically, you know, they're fishermen. Um, so it's, uh, it's not a, a good place to be if you're a, um, 
you know, you're a Vietnamese fisherman or, um, I, you know, Taiwanese, any of this, there's just this constant uh, harassment and uh, bullying uh, because, you know, they, they have a lot of, um, which we would say are um, illegal claims to, uh, to the seas um, in that area. And so it's, there's just, there's a lot of uh, problems with it. We used to actually do some things with the Chinese. We had, um, I think we even had a Chinese shipwriter on one of our ships to do fisheries, but it's just uh, their role has really changed. And it's just, they, they see the Coast Guard also as a, a warship, which we are. Um, and so our relationship has really uh, changed in that regard. Do you think we're, we'll see a larger presence uh, the Coast Guard in the Pacific? I mean, we are, we are doing that because of the uh, illegal fisheries that it's very hard to get at unless you, uh, you have to build other Coast Guards because no one else is going to protect uh, your fishery for you. And uh, a lot of, you know, the, the African continent and now even uh, South America, they've either, they either have had, they've sold their fishing rights to China, uh, stupidly um, or they are just getting fished out because the Chinese are very smart about when they uh, they'll send they'll, they, they'll send uh, their fishermen around the world they have no qualms about that um, they need fish they need resources um, and uh, so they'll they'll sit outside and eat easy and then they'll turn off their um, their location information, which is illegal, uh, but they'll turn it off enough to go into an EEZ and then come back out. So you'll see these patterns of, uh, if you look at, you know, a, like a, a satellite picture, you'll see sort of how, how they operate, but they are fishing out, um, you know, our oceans and, um, because they need to feed their people. And, um, they're also doing, um, a lot of, uh, what is it called? Uh, rare earth mineral deep sea mining. And that's something we're not doing, but uh, we need those rare earth minerals um, for our technology, even for our, um, if we want to have Teslas and I would love to have a Tesla. <laughs> so <laughs> it's, uh, you know, so the Chinese are really, they're all over the place. So for the Coast Guard, we tend to like, we work, we have some folks at AFRICOM and PACOM and we're working with um, smaller countries to help them either we have a ship rider come with us but ultimately we, we want to train them to uh to defend their own seas because they don't need they don't need navies they need coast guards um and they really want help in forming uh, a coast guard to stop these you know these poachers where, where do they get their ships i mean are they building new ships or do they mostly buy old like French frigate or something like that. I yeah, we we give them, uh, you know, foreign military sales. We we tend to give uh, our older and older is really old for the Coast Guard, but um, yeah, we tend to give uh, our our equipment to them. Um, so yeah, they're they're not, and they mostly they need, they need small boats and they need training. They don't um, this idea that you know you get a boat and you're okay. Uh, that is there's so much to it. So. We have to really work with them to build everything from the laws um, to, you know, how you operate, um, a, you know, how you do a law enforcement mission, how you get on board another boat. It's it's really um, you know soup to nuts. Um, so we actually we have uh, we had some lawyers uh, probably about ten or fifteen years ago. We had this big move to have a standard maritime code so that other countries would sort of follow our code so it'd be easier to enforce their laws and they would, you know, be, so we have some countries, uh, actually like uh, Georgia has uh, the US maritime code, um, but at least now they can take chunks of it because when you go to, uh, I, I used to go when I was doing law enforcement uh, law, I would go to like uh, countries in Latin America and, uh, you meet with people there, police and, and prosecutors, and, and they would say, you know, we, we can't, uh, like in El Salvador, for instance, we can't prosecute these people because you have to bring uh, the vessel back within, you know, five hours or you drop the case. And, you know, they have, they have things that really limit their ability to prosecute um, witness uh, issues, all kinds of things. So 
we, we're trying to help them uh, with all of that. And it's, um, you know, we can't be there. We can't patrol the world. So that's sort of how we're trying to help. Well, here, here's some more questions I got. And these were anonymous. Uh, what does the U.S. Coast Guard look for in JAG applicants? My guess it's from a law student. Uh, oh. <laughs> as, <laughs> I'm shocked. Does Coast Guard, do Coast Guard JAGs have to be qualified mariners? We answered that. And here's another one. I really interested to hear the answer. Is there a way to be a part-time Coast Guard JAG, for example, similar to the Army National Guard? Do you have reserves? Yes. <laughs> we just created it. Um, I think last year might have been our first year. We're bringing oh in uh, we're bringing some reserve JAGs because we always need uh, reserves for uh, hurricane response, um, you know, all kinds of things. And we've had, we have some folks who uh, joined us in that. We give them, uh, we, I think they go to like two weeks of, of, you know, learn about the Coast Guard. I don't know if they go to the whole, they might go the whole five weeks, but I will tell you, I, I met um, a couple when I was visiting our lawyers up in Boston. And uh, one of them was telling me he did labor law. And uh, he just wanted to do something, you know, do some different things in the Coast Guard. And then uh, as this COVID mandate um, thing kind of dragged on and on, um, we basically put him on active duty for six months and he came down and he's um, working Once out of Boston. Once squirrel finds acorn, you know, yeah, exactly you know, the right place at the right time. Yeah, you just never know what, uh, what you know, so we, we are bringing in uh, people in the reserve side um, as well. Um, on the active side, we bring in a real mix of people. We have some people who are um, in other services uh, enlisted. Uh, we have people who are, uh, you know, uh, assistant state's attorneys. Um, we've had people work at law firms and hate it. Um, we have one. <laughs> we have one who was a, working in environmental um, environmental defense, and she said, "I, I can't do that anymore." <laughs> so uh, she. Uh, she said, I have to work for the good guys. Um, so yeah, we had a real variety. We have one woman, this is so fascinating to me. I don't know if you'll find this fascinating, but I, I love this. She, uh, she originally came from um, Ireland um, and she, uh, I guess, went to uh, law school in New York and she worked, um, I think she worked in a, a state's attorney's office there for several years, but we brought her in and uh, one of her, uh, when you say, oh, what, do, what is something unique about you that uh, you know no one would know unless you told them. And, and she was one of those um, river dance dancers. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I thought, I'm glad it was a river dance dancer. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think, well, it's great. So we have some unique people. Um, obviously we look for people who, uh, who are um, passionate about um, helping others because that's a lot of what we do and uh, we'll fit in to an environment uh, where, you know, it's not a routine every day necessarily that, you know, you, you could do one thing one day and, and be called to do something else. Um, so I, I we think get that's a, I was just gonna say, I think that's a really good point about military service. You, if, if you're bent on the idea that you wanna do the same thing every day, it's probably not, not a good fit. You have to be ready for whatever, you know. Yeah, you had quite a career, you did a lot of different things, so not hold a job. Um, <laughs> uh, what would you, uh, do you, do you have books you'd recommend uh, for a student or a practitioner or, or uh, things like that? What news <laughs> sources do you prefer? <laughs> and my husband's looking at me because <laughs> I, uh, I follow all the crazies on Twitter. Um, this is you really are fun. Brave. If you're doing Twitter, you are a brave woman. No, nah, I just look at it. I, I don't post ever, <laughs> but although you can get tempted sometimes, um, but um, we just yeah. started a LinkedIn account here. I, I have a really uh, very talented uh, research assistant, Nicole de Brugan, and um, she set it up and uh, Miss. The regard uh, is uh, is running it. So whatever's on there, um, I'm responsible for. <laughs> but, wow. But, you know. Well, I will I will uh, follow you guys. Um, we have Excellent. some kind of link. 
Yeah, we have a LinkedIn too, but it's, it's such a hassle and it has to be some lieutenant who's got other legal work to do has to like keep up it, keep it up. So you have to have someone who really likes doing that. Otherwise it's- um, I think that's very point. true. Uh, you know, to have the visibility and social media is good, but you have to have somebody that's passionate about keeping it up. Um, what what leadership, we're, we are running out of times, but I want to pick your brain. Uh, what leadership lessons or tips would you give to others who, who want to be Admiral Burke? Hmm. Well, I'm not replaceable. <laughs> no. uh, well, I talk with I mean, you, the, 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 the more I, uh, more I like of, you. Oh, thank you. Well, so first of all, uh, and I'm sure you tell people the same thing, uh, you've got to be yourself. Uh, trying to, uh, while you work for people and you emulate some of the things they do, some of the way they handle issues, and, and you learn about how to handle people watching others. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, you, you know, you're, you are you, and uh, that's what's valuable. And while um, I, I, I used to hear uh, our, you know, leaders saying like, you're going to come into the Coast Guard and we're going to make a coastie out of you or, you know, whatever it is. And uh, I don't tell people that anymore. I say you're going to make the Coast Guard better. So, uh, you know, bring your talents uh, to bear because we uh, we change and we evolve uh, because of that. We don't evolve unless we have that. And and I've seen. Uh, oh, my gosh. When I was not practicing law, uh, I had a enlisted guy who came up with a this corrosion formula that basically changed the way we inspect ships. And, uh, you know, just, he was interested in it and he was uh, interested in math and he did it. And we were able to get him up to our, um, our headquarters and, and work with engineers to make it happen. And I, I love that in, in the law, yeah. I was, uh, as a, as a Lieutenant, Lieutenant commander, I was trying, I was uh, working with ion scan technology to get that accepted um, as evidence. And now we use it just routinely. Um, you know, there's always, there's always innovative things if you're open to it. If you're not open to it, it's, uh, you know, you're, you're gonna just make people like you. And uh, we've, we try to do that a lot. And so that's why we have uh, not a lot of women. Um, but now I think the light is flashing on that, uh, you know, you can't expect everybody to want to come to your watering hole that, you know, we need to have a place where people like to go and they can uh, make it their own. Yeah. One last thing, I, I guess, uh, well, I wish this wasn't, we, we could kill off the whole afternoon, believe me, but uh, <laughs> uh, because you are really so authentic and and fresh and and just everything that you would want to see in a military leader um what you know military leaders in general but military in particular they often get a lot of criticism and a lot of that criticism is unfair because people don't have all the facts but you really can't give them all the facts for like a thousand different reasons how do you process and deal with criticism especially when you know it's unfair so I was, uh, when I was doing congressional and governmental affairs, there were times when uh, I thought we should just say, you know what, we could have done better. Um, and instead, you know, we tend to hunker down, all the services tend to hunker down and just say, just repeat the same things. And uh, I don't think that's, uh, that's necessarily, uh, productive because in the long run, nobody will believe you about anything. So I think where, uh, where you can uh, give, you know, provide more facts uh, than you do. And uh, where, where you own something, you have to, you have to own it. And it's, um, I think uh, the Navy has suffered uh, because they don't, uh, they're very uncomfortable with that philosophy. And uh, we've suffered as well. We, we had some issues that were just bogging us down um, needlessly, I think, but we never said, uh, you know, we could have done better. And so it just became this rallying cry <laughs> to uh, tear us apart on this issue. And uh, 
I, I think that's what people want to hear. That's what I want to hear. If I think somebody has done something wrong, I want them to say, you know what, uh, you know, I learned from what you said. You're right. I could, I could do better. And uh, please give me that chance. Uh, it's, it's very welcome and the people who do it, I think are rewarded for it, but it's very seldom done. And uh, that's why we get into these battles with, you know, with people in the media over really nothing sometimes. One last thing and then we, we do have to go, unfortunately. Um, you spent, you know, your professional life in the Coast Guard. Any regrets or are you glad you did it? What would you say to somebody young uh who was looking forward to say practicing law and and trying to figure out a public service route um you know the military is probably the hardest one um but what what would you say to them so um i think you know you can bite off one elephant one chunk of the elephant at a time i mean i i think it's great to experience uh, it and move on because uh, you will take that with you your, your whole life. Um, so, uh, you know, I, and I think if you're enjoying yourself, um, I, you know, the years just sort of went by. I, I really uh, had some really fun jobs. I, I made great friends and, and the, the Coast Guard, because we are small and because so many of us came from the same uh, commissioning source, <laughs> everywhere you go, you know people so you know you get stationed in alaska you get stationed in boston you're going to see people that you've known over the years and so it feels uh 